Hey, Dr. John Torres here on my Dr. Doc series, where every week I talk to experts around the world about things coronavirus specific, things pandemic specific, and things hopefully that you can use, information you can use to help you, your family, your loved ones, your community get through this pandemic sooner rather than later and as healthy as possible. And I use experts to help me do that, doctors around the globe uh, that can help us get that information. And today we're very lucky to have with us Dr. Jonathan DePiero, he's a PhD assistant professor of psychiatry at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and a clinical director of the Center for Stress, Resilience and Personal Growth. John, thanks for being here with us. Thank you for inviting me. What I wanna talk about today, and uh, the reason I wanna talk about it is because it's been in the news through cycles throughout these last couple of years, but it's really hitting home right now. And that is burnout and stress. Almost two years into this pandemic, we're two years into the virus, we're about a month and a half away from two years into the pandemic. Explain first and foremost, what is burnout? Right, so burnout has a few different components. It, one component of burnout is exhaustion. People are just really tired. They have a <laughs> lot going on in their lives. There's a lot that's being asked of them, particularly healthcare providers are exhausted. They're also, maybe because they're exhausted, feeling a little bit disconnected from their work and from their everyday lives. They don't get that joy or happiness or pleasure from their day-to-day -day lives that used to get. So, and even in their patient care, they might feel a little distant from their patients. Um, and they also don't feel the sense that they're making a difference. That sense of exhaustion pervades their work and they don't feel like what they do on a day-to-day -day basis actually matters. They don't feel like they're causing an effect and, and making change. You know, being an emergency room doctor, going in for your shifts is always tough. And it always has been for the last two decades. You go in, you come out, you are, you've been stressed, you're very tired, you're very exhausted, but you tend to get a break after that before your next shift. And then you, know, you get those breaks in between. Is that not happening right now? Right, so it probably varies depending on hospitals. A lot of hospitals across the country are facing staffing shortages, which places a burden, an additional burden on the staff that are there uh, being asked to take extra shifts. Um, and I think also with other responsibilities that people have in their lives. For example, imagine being a healthcare worker who has parenting or childcare responsibilities. And then all of a sudden the daycare is closed or the babysitter is not available. So you have to juggle the shift and your personal life. That makes it even more challenging. And it might not feel like you have a break, even when you have a day off you're playing catch up still in the rest of your life. And I wanna make sure that we address this because it is serious that this is not just restricted to healthcare workers. That's right. This is essentially everyone, not just in the US, but around the globe. We're experiencing a lot of burnout that we've never really experienced in our lives. That's right. Everyone, um, it's fair to say everyone's been touched by this coronavirus pandemic in some way. Some people it's been extremely taxing and they've developed depression or anxiety or symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. But it's fair to say that everyone has been upset by this and taxed and exhausted by this just being so chronic. It's a chronic stress that we've not really seen before. Now, when we talk about healthcare workers, a lot of times people focus on you know, the doctors or the nurses, but this is not just doctors or nurses. This is across the spectrum of people in the healthcare in industry, basically, correct? You're absolutely right. There are so many folks that work in a healthcare institution, work in a doctor's office. We have uh, housekeeping staff called environmental service workers. We have folks who do the cooking and delivering meals. Um, we have security guards. Mount Sinai has a huge research team of researchers doing the very hard work on developing uh, treatments for coronavirus and doing the other work that they do. Uh, they're all healthcare workers as well. Um, and they might not get as much attention in articles. Um, they might not feel like the nation was clapping for them two years ago, um, but they require attention as well um, because they're suffering just as much and maybe even more. And, you know, it's interesting because a few weeks ago on the Dr. Doc series, we had a lab director and she said, you know, you hear a lot about the, the medical staff at the hospital, and yes, they do have burnout, but 
lab personnel are having a lot of burnout because they are running so many more tests than they ran before. Their shifts are extending to 12 hour shifts. They don't get a break. And then they're getting that pressure of like, why can't you get these tests out faster mm -hmm. when it's not humanly possible to do so? Does all that all add up? Absolutely, it adds up. You know, I, I was just thinking about this the other day. I can't imagine what it would be like to work in a, in a lab, a testing facility where you get flooded with swab after swab after swab. Uh, you might work really long hours and you're handling potentially hazardous materials. Uh, you have to go home to your family and you're still at, at risk of exposure, even you know, inc somewhat increased risk of exposure. Um, that has to be exhausting. Um, and also where you feel like there's no end in sight. It's, it would make sense to feel that way. When is this gonna be over? When am I not gonna be swamped? And who is here to help me? as a lab worker. You know, and over the pandemic, over these last couple of years, we've had wave after wave after wave of these surges. How does that impact burnout? It, it makes sense that that would impact burnout in a negative way and make it worse because there is no break. Uh, you, you know, we overcome one challenge or at least in part, uh, but this, the risk is always there, the risk continued to be there in the background, and then there was another wave and another wave. So it, there was lulls, but then there, you know, especially healthcare workers were asked uh, to respond again to, you know, increased hospitalizations and even, you know, a peak, a, a peak in deaths. Um, and so there, it makes people even more tired, even more checked out, a sense that this is not gonna be over anytime soon and they encounter death and dying up close. And even separate from burnout, that has a very real emotional impact. Seeing a patient, seeing more patients than is typical for you suffer up close. You know, you know as an emergency room physician that healthcare workers encounter suffering on a daily basis, but the pandemic in its multiple waves has presented untold amounts of human suffering that as healthcare workers, we bear witness to. And as human beings, it weighs on you. It weighs on your mind, it weighs on your body and your soul. How, John, how difficult is it that, you know, I'm thinking back to last summer when we were getting notices like, okay, you know, we can start, start dropping masks. We're kind of getting a new normal. And then all of a sudden the Delta wave hits and then the Omicron wave hits. How difficult is it to kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel and all of a sudden get that snatched away from you? Right, it could feel like that hope is snatched away. and we're back to square one again, you know, right back where we were. You know, in reality, we know quite a bit about how to treat coronavirus now. This wave affected people differently, especially folks who uh, chose to get vaccinated. Um, but it can certainly feel like, um, you, you know, again, back to square one and that there isn't a set end date in sight when we know, okay, we'll be back to normal. In fact, we don't even know what normal is gonna look like six months from now or a year from now. There has to be a yeah, new it, adjustment or an accommodation to the possibility even that the virus is in the background. You know, it was interesting because a year ago, a year and a half ago, we were talking about the new normal being around the corner, like at the end of the tunnel, we're rounding the curve, flattening the trajectory, all those different things. And then these variants hit. And it, like you said, it makes you kind of get that sense of, well, number one, deja vu, here we go again, but also number two, like, when is this going to end? And that surely has to not just healthcare workers, but anyone around the country, anyone around the globe of just going, you know, I am sick and tired of this. It's re-traumatizing in a very real way. Does burnout have anything to do with the, the you know, we get to a certain point where people are tired of masks. They're tired of social distancing. They're tired of the news day after day pounding away at the, you know, here's the latest, greatest kind of thing. Does that contribute to burnout or does burnout contribute to that? Or is it kind of a two-way street? Yeah, so the relationship between burnout and adherence to the public health measures is not really been looked at so much in the research. I think that would be a really great thing for folks to, to, to take a look at. Um, there is a sense that you know, certainly folks who choose not to get vaccinated or might not wear masks as they would recommend it to do, they might say, oh, it doesn't make a difference anyway. Either I'm gonna get it regardless of what I do, or if I get it, I'll be fine because I've been vaccinated. Um, and that might relate to some of the cynicism around that, that could come up in burnout of like, oh, it doesn't really matter anyway. 
but we know it has a very real impact the, the choices people make these days. Now you're the clinical director for the Center for Stress, Resilience and Personal Growth at Mount Sinai, the Icon School of Medicine. Does burnout in 2021, 2022 look different than burnout in 2020? Yeah, certainly it's increasing. We see increasing rates of burnout. There was a recent study um, survey done by Medscape that showed that um, between 40 and 50% of physicians reported burnout with cl critical care doctors, ICU doctors, you know, being the highest female physicians having the highest rate of burnout compared to male, physician, uh, male physicians. Um, so we're seeing increased rates of burnout. Uh, so it looks differently in that there's more of it. Um, and it also bleeds into symptoms of depression and anxiety. You know, our center uh, at Mount Sinai, the Center for Stress, Resilience and Personal Growth really takes a multi-pronged approach to addressing some of these effects. We work with our partners um, at other offices, including the Office of Wellbeing and Resilience to think about this and addressing this a few different ways. Supporting leaders, reducing the paperwork that folks have to do as healthcare workers, so the administrative burdens that contribute to burnout, and making sure people have resources around childcare, and for folks who've developed depression and anxiety, who are healthcare workers at Mount Sinai, providing immediate access to care without having to call multiple phone numbers, um, getting folks into treatment very quickly to help address the downstream effects of the, the longstanding nature of this, this pandemic. And one of the ideas behind this, one of the reasons we thought about doing this is I was talking to a pediatrician friend of mine over the weekend, and I thought what you told me was very poignant. It was kind of hit the nail on the head. And he said, essentially, you know, you know when, when patients go to the clinic, they see the happy face of the healthcare worker in there. But what they don't see is the fallout from all the amount of work they're doing. And he said also that it's not uncommon, which I agree with, to go to a nurse's station, to go to a doctor's station and seeing people, seeing the workers cry, which, you know, never happened before the pandemic. And just that is not uncommon to see. Is that the degree showing you kind of where we are right now and, and how things stand? Yeah, so many, so many healthcare workers share with me that before their shift, after their shift, they're crying in their cars. They might not wanna go to the workplace because of what they might have to, to face there, the work that they have to do there. There's been a real and devastating emotional impact, even more so than before the pandemic of the nature of the work. I think there, there has to be an understanding that healthcare workers are human beings first before they're healthcare workers. And the work, um, you know, treating people with illnesses is exhausting. Uh, there's so much paperwork that you have to do as a, you know, as an ER doctor, but as, you know, especially as a nurse or other provider um, that takes away from the moment, the time you have with a patient, which might be why some people got into the job in the first place to have that human connection and to feel like you're making a difference in someone's lives. But when you have a mound of charting to do, that human connection is lost. Um, and all you see, or and you might be afraid of encountering um, you know, verbal abuse, there's been an increase in physical abuse against healthcare workers. Um, and that's something, and, and also feeling like you've done something wrong or could have done more to save people during the pandemic, that self-blame uh, fuels a lot of that emotional, understandable emotional reactivity, that crying. What are the long-term effects? So the long-term effects of the pandemic, in some ways, we don't have a crystal ball, we don't know. One of the things that I know, you now I formerly did work in the World Trade Center Health Program at Mount Sinai. So it's mm -hmm. a federally funded program to take care of 9-11 responders. Right. Um, what we know is that those 9-11 responders are still struggling to this day with the impact of what they saw and did on the response effort. Uh, many are struggling with PTSD, uh, some of whom um, maybe waited until they retired years later to get treatment that they needed. Uh, we know that there is going to be a need for increased access to care for healthcare providers, uh, a need to reduce stigma around help seeking, a need to recognize the real impact of the work during, before, during, and after the pandemic on the well being of healthcare providers, and a need broad strokes to make administrative changes, to work on you know, reducing you know, charting time, uh, making you know, accommodations around work-life balance 
so that the, it doesn't feel like it's just on the individual healthcare provider to help themselves, to pull themselves up by the bootstrap. Um, it really, a multi-layered approach is needed moving, moving forward because it's gonna have a real lasting impact on the workforce if you don't do something and take it seriously. So the question I'm gonna ask is, I'm using the word solution, but that's not the, the best word to use, but what are the solutions for number one, healthcare workers, and then just general advice for anybody listening. Let's start with the healthcare workers. What, what are the solutions for them going forward? What are some things that can help out? Right, so what I would say is that broad strokes, there's not one solution. So I think for a healthcare worker, if you're reading something or looking online, you see an ad and it says, do this and you'll be less burnt out, do this and it will cure your burnout, uh, be skeptical. Uh, some things work for some people to an extent, but others, uh, others it might just be you know, a, waste of, a waste of time and resources. There is not just one solution. Um, it has to be a multi-tiered approach with structural changes and, in, and things that an individual can do. One thing I can suggest is find your people. I know I still talk, talk to all the folks that I trained with in graduate school and on internship. And it's been such a buffer for me. Find people you can talk to about what you're, what's going on in your lives, coworkers, colleagues, build that support. Think about the difference that you make. And it might be that you make a note at the end of the day of something that went well, something that you're grateful for, something nice a patient said about you amidst maybe some negative things that patients say. Hold on to that. Try to connect to that joy as much as you can. And try to do something for yourself. It doesn't need to be hours on an exercise machine. Do one thing that respects how you're feeling in the moment. But if it's crying in your car, that's what you need to do in that moment. That's okay. I mean, also recognize when you need professional support. There are many high quality treatments out there for depression and anxiety and, and post-traumatic stress. You have to know that you're experiencing it and, and you know, check in with yourself, speak to a provider and get help if you are, um, because those resources are for the most part available. Certainly within our center, that's something we spent a lot of time thinking about from our World Trade Center experience of knowing the pandemic is going to have a real impact and putting timely resources in place so that folks don't need to worry about where they're going to get help. And how about for the general public? How about those that are not necessarily in healthcare, but out there as well? What advice would you give them? Similar? Yeah, very similar advice. I think it's true, you know, is for example, being a parent. I'm not a parent, but I know that being a parent can feel really isolating. You're tied up and doing all the stuff for your kids and then you go to work and you're balancing you know, all the responsibilities and the emails about testing and what's come out positive. Um, and it could be just two minutes in the bathroom for yourself, you know, by yourself alone. Do carve out just a little bit of time each day to do something for you. And it could just be sitting in quiet or it could be taking some deep breaths. It could be texting a friend. It doesn't need to be something tremendous, but carve out just a few minutes each day that are for you. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what you do in that time, but it has to be your time. And I think a lot of people think I need 30 minutes, I need an hour, but you're saying even a couple minutes. Even a couple minutes make a difference. And the successes, the difference that, that those few seconds make builds on itself. And then maybe you take more time a couple of weeks later and a more time after that. And joy breeds joy positive emotions like happiness, even calm, feed into itself and actually cause people to you know, take more steps. But even two minutes makes a big difference. Yeah, John, thank you. enough. I can't thank you enough for being here and helping us with this. But what parting message would you give to people listening to this about you know, where we are in a pandemic, where we are moving forward and just kind of you know, ways to approach it, not just over the next few months, but years to come? Right. I would say two things. One is that we don't know when this is gonna be over, but this will be over. Uh, and these challenges that we face right now are a right now challenge. They're not a forever challenge. And I also want people to know, the psychologist, part, pardon me, wants people to know that if they're sitting at home listening and suffering, suffering under the weight of depression or anxiety, or having intrusive memories of what they saw as a healthcare worker, for example, help is out there. They're not alone. And I want people to know that they're not alone in those experiences. If they're feeling something, good chance that their neighbor's feeling the same thing. 
Well, John, thank you very much for being here again and, uh, and appreciate the information you've given us and kind of the insight into where we are and hopefully where we can go with this and, and helping a lot of people out. But again, Dr. Johnson DiPiero, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and importantly, the Clinical Director of the Center for Stress, Resilience, and Personal Growth, which we can all use right now, more and more of that. So thank you for being here and thank you for helping us out, John. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. You too.